Good morning, welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us. Really good to see you all. Um, my name is Deb Nelson. I'm the Vice President of Community and Client Engagement from RSF Social Finance, and I'm here with three people that I respect and admire so much. And we get, to, I love you, yes, I love these three people. Um, and I have the great honor and pleasure of working with all of them on our Integrated Capital Institute. So we have Akaya Winwood from Wisebridge, former president of Rockwood Leadership Institute. We have Joel Solomon, co-founder of Renewal Funds and author of The Clean Money Revolution. And we have Amaka Agbo, founder and principal of Amaka Agbo Consulting and an ICI fellow. And we launched our Integrated Capital Institute three years ago because we wanted to share what we'd been learning about how to activate capital, diverse forms of capital, both financial and social, and how to activate it in all its forms to affect systemic change. And um, it's been a total pleasure working with our fellows, our faculty, advisors. I see a couple of our fellows in the audience. How many fellows are both current fellows and new fellows are with us in the audience? I think Wendy is here too. Awesome. Um, and it's one of the things that gives me great hope these days is working with these incredible change makers that have such big visions and are doing such important work in the world. Um, and I wanted to share a quote that I read from uh, Bill McKibben. He was interviewed earlier this year and they asked him, where do you see the greatest signs of hope? And he said, to me, movements are the great sign of hope. The fact that people are beginning to come together in numbers to stand up. And we agree with Bill. And we are a part of a growing movement of financial activists that are working on a simple yet radical goal, and that is to create an economy that works for all people and the planet. And uh, we think we don't have time to wait, that it's time to rethink our assumptions about money, how we activate it, and how we leverage capital in all its forms. So I have a quick confession to make. I'm asking them very big, complex questions. Every question that I ask really deserves a half an hour answer, but I'm only giving them about three minutes. So I've asked them to share nuggets of wisdom, but you're not gonna get the whole enchilada. You can come up and speak to us later and get in touch with us after the panel, but we're gonna be short and concise and compelling. So here we go. Akaya, Joel, Amaka. How did you become a financial activist, and why does it matter to you? Akaya? Well, I was sitting around wondering what I was going to do for the rest of my life. Um, actually, I don't know that I would call myself a financial activist. I come from leadership. Uh, I feel like my job is to support those people who are, actually, who are going to be the ones who are going to reimagine our financial and economic systems. Um, it, you know, I've been in social change forever. And um, it seems to me that as much as we want to say, oh, capitalism is going to die and the markets are going to fall, then all that will probably be true to some degree. We're still humans, and humans trade. And we're going to need markets. We're going to need ways to actually exchange ideas and goods, et cetera. So that's not going to go away. What's exciting to me is what, is what we can imagine, and Marco will talk about this, and Joel will as well, uh, uh, in terms of can, can we imagine and invent si new systems that are equitable? Because these systems that we're currently in, despite, if I, even if I were sitting on the biggest pile of money on the planet, still wouldn't work for me, because this vast inequality doesn't serve in the long run. So, how fun. Let's get together and recreate, uh, create some new systems, imagine them into to being, and do the work of, of creating that. Um, that's what the fellowship's about, but um, that to me is really exciting and why I'm in it, because it, it, it calls for creativity, given that the markets aren't going to go away. They'll just shift and change. Hello, everyone. I was messed with by the 60s and what went on in society then. Uh, lots of different dimensions of that. Yes. The urgencies are clear. 
on so many levels. We know that there's more than enough money in the world. We know that money is concentrated pretty effectively in the hands of the fewer. Money has a story to it. It affected people in places. While we hold it, it affects people in places. And when we deploy it, it does as well. We don't pay enough attention to what that means and what our responsibility is related to it. There is more than enough money combined with human ingenuity to solve most of the problems and crises we face. We need to think about how much is enough, what that means to us. We need to consider our responsibility for all that impact on people and places. And we need to have our money doing things that we believe in and that align with our values. That's not necessarily simple, but it's getting easier. This place is loaded with stories and methods. Financial activists are going to be needed as those of us that have more than enough watch the challenges grow and watch society get wobblier. Our job with this is to help create a wave and help support a wave of people who can handle a next level deeper of the complexity of deploying money beyond impact investing. What is social change investing? So I'm dedicated with the rest of my coherence to support that concept to gain traction. You guys are so good at modeling the three minute thing. I'm gonna do my best. Um, so the question of being a financial activist, um, I would start by saying I see this work as a continuation of my ongoing social and racial justice work. It's just another way that I've continued to fight for equity um, and liberation for those that have been most impacted, right? The same like we would have a policy director kind of work on bills and legislation or community organizer go door to door. Um, I want to share a little bit about how I came to this work because people oftentimes ask me, um, how did somebody who was actually kind of doing on the ground organizing now be sitting on a stage in SOCAP? Um, and there's two stories that I'll share um, about myself. Um, I had the privilege, the privilege of working at, at an organization called the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights for a number of years. And one of the first campaigns I worked on was our Green Collar Jobs campaign. The Green Collar Jobs campaign, some of you may be aware, it was a movement where we were calling for an investment in green jobs to fight poverty and pollution at the same time. And so I spent a lot of time working, bringing together multi-stakeholder uh, leaders that were engaged in union organizing, people working in cities, people um, working on education and workforce development to try to create these programs that would then train people to get the entry-level jobs um, into those green job career pathways. One of the things that happened as we started to see the economic recession in 2008 is that the green collar jobs movement came heavily under attack. And one of the things that I think allowed the movement to, to be attacked was the fact that our analysis around where power was being held in that movement and who ultimately got to make the decisions about how our call for a green economy was being structured continued to be those that had wealth and capital. Right? It wasn't actually the workers that we were fighting to get entry level jobs in. We didn't actually have an analysis of who was owning the businesses and how the, we were then making the decisions. And then who was also investing the capital into really revitalizing the screen economy. Right? So we, it really forced me to really look at, can we be bolder? Can we be more audacious in what we're calling for? Another um, key event that happened also coming off of the end of the recession for me was around 2012 in the Bay Area and I offer across um, the country is when we started to see a number of social justice organizations um, have to lay off staff, some organizations even closed. And that was because 2012 was just around the time these organizations were starting to experience the delayed impacts of the 2008 recession. And for me, at the time I was in a leadership role at an organization and 
really recognized that we were looking to one individual to have all the answers for how we were going to address our financial issues in our organization. I did not, my, I myself did not have enough understanding of the economy and what was happening and what it would mean for our organizations that heavily relied on philanthropic dollars to sustain our social movements. Right, So kind of those two events really led me to start to kind of want to understand what was happening in the broader economy beyond philanthropy, right? beyond nonprofit social justice movements, and also starting to see many um, philanthropies responding to the recession with a call for more program-related investments, more mission-related investments without ever actually educating our organizations about what those dollars meant and how we could use them to sustain our work. And so that's where I started to kind of pull on this thread of this emerging impact investing movement and what it meant to start to really look at how we can start to use philanthropic dollars um, as the entry point to actually open up more traditional capital markets in a way that helps to move non-extractive capital um, to social movements on the ground. And so I think it's helpful for folks to understand how our social movements need to be resourced and sustained um, as a broad part of what it means to really transform um, our financial systems. All right, here's another simple topic and quick question. We want to move from an economy that's based on extraction and greed to an economy that's based on regeneration and interconnectedness. What do we need to do to make that happen? She's an excellent facilitator. Well, I started with something about this, and the next step would be as we assess what we have, whether it is our financial resources or our human resources, all hands on deck now. Uh, whatever we can do, we need to be thinking with a screen about the future of decent civilization and a place that future generations can have at least a bit of what we have. That requires psychological, emotional, and spiritual development along with practical skills. We have to get clear about the meaning of life, our purpose, and what we're going to do with this precious life. Uh, the models for us of what success means are a little off. We're hopefully developing some new models of what it means. Uh, one way that simplifies it for me is uh, being a billionaire is a big uh, goal for a lot of people. <clears throat> it's a fairly silly goal unless you know what you want to do with a billion dollars and why you want to do it and while you get there, all the things that you do to get there. So that applies whether you're billion dollars or whether we're just comfortably affluent. Um, and that's who I'm primarily speaking to. We have to be part of building a vision and a map and roadmaps so that next generations are supported to do things differently. And we have to be the stewards of the long-term future. So what does that mean to each of us? We have, to, we have to all figure that out. But we can't ignore figuring it out. We have a responsibility and future generations are watching us. They're studying this time. They're scratching their heads. They want to know how we got in this pickle and why we're carrying on partying while uh, the planet suffers and people suffer. So assess our life and see how we can be more participating in a more safe, clean, fair future for everyone. Ignore politics at our peril, take responsibility in our communities, find ways to stay strong, hopeful, and resilient. It's going to be more and more crucial. We, we are sitting on the cusp of possibly facing a future that we do not yet understand what it will be like to be part of. That's exciting. It's a big responsibility. Please pay attention to it. Raise your hand 
if you wake up in the morning and say, wow, it's working, this is really working for me. <laughs> and working for the people that I know, and the people that I love, and the people I care about. Yeah, I'm not seeing a whole lot of hands in the room. And I don't think that we are an unusual audience. I mean, perhaps there's a room somewhere in Washington where everybody would raise their hands, but I would even say f for them it's not working because this is a very precarious um, bubble that we're in right here. Um, look, I think one of the most atrocious um, artifacts of oppression and white male supremacist patriarchy, yeah, I said that, um, is the cost of isolation from one another. It teaches me that I'm over here and you're over there, or you're over here and I'm over here, and, and, and there are systemic barriers that we have to honor and keep in place in order for the current systems to work. And that is, that's just catastrophic. Because it means then I have to pretend that Joel, white man, straight, Jewish, wealthy, and I, queer, African-American, raised very working class, are not supposed to be sitting here together. We're just, it's just, we're breaking big taboos, let alone work together, let alone like each other, let alone, dare I say it, love each other. So if we're going to change these systems, it's going to require that we stop it. Just stop and refuse to, to let those artificially created boundaries be real and snuggle up to people who we've been told should not be even within speaking distance, let alone um, touching difference, and taking the risk of doing that. Because it's risky. Huh, Bill? It's risky. Um, so it really, it takes big courage to say, okay, I'm just gonna not, we're, we're not gonna play that anymore. And to get close to folks. It's, it's, it's uh, for me, it's less about extraction. I mean, that's a bad thing. Don't stop exploiting people. Let's just stop that. But the only way I know to interrupt the exploitation and the extraction is to know folks. Is to say, oh, I, would I, do I wanna do that to my, my, my kin? My sibling, my cousin, I don't want to do that. And to, it, maybe it's reductive here, but I actually don't believe we're going to shift theoretically. We are not going to change our systems because I'm sitting in my uh, office thinking about things. We're going to shift because we actually get out there and do some work and cross some boundaries. To kind of underscore what Akaya and Joel shared, I, you know, I think we're dealing with the realities that we're looking at the financialization of our relationships, right? Our relationships have been commodified. Um, and part of the work is to figure out how we reclaim those relationships and understanding that that into itself takes time. Uh, a friend of mine, Mervyn Mercano, talks about we can only move at the speed of trust. Right? And so when we look at the fact that it's taken centuries and decades to create this level of harm, this level of disrepair, it is also going to take the time of building relationships and building trust for us to get out of it. Right? And so how do we actually move in a way in which we are supporting people on the ground who are really doing the work um, to move at the speed of which their communities can kind of grow and to also be able to experiment and innovate. I think oftentimes in this field, I observe kind of this um, pressure for these communities to kind of have the perfect solution. Right? Whereas the, those of us who have kind of the privilege and the ability to be here in this room kind of get a little bit more buffer and time to, to figure out how we're going to go along and work things out. Right? And so how do we extend the level of grace to one another, to each other, to recognize that this work will take time, but to also hold each other and ourselves accountable to doing the work? 
right? So I think there's one piece around relationships, around the, inter the individual action, the interpersonal relationships. I think the other side of it is that we are dealing with structures um, and systems that have also created systemic harm. Right, so the, the level of harm, like when we talk about the racial wealth gap, it's not like an earthquake happened and everything opened up and some of us were left over here and the rest of us were over here with all the resources, right? There were very intentional policies, very intentional practices that focused in on the, dis the distribution of land, wealth, and power across this country that created that gap. Right? And so when we talk about what is it actually going to take to, to engage in interconnection, we have to close that gap. And we close that gap by having the same level of systemic and government investment back into the redistribution of that same land, wealth, and power. Um, I am oftentimes kind of see that the response that we take to addressing the racial wealth gap is, well, you know, people should open a savings account and, you know, we'll train them in finan financial literacy. We respond to a systemic problem by telling indivi with re individual responses and actions. We actually haven't figured out as a movement that's focused in on the economy how we leverage our own economic power to then engage in the political front um, of the work that needs to happen. Right? Oftentimes when we see communities get the, the wins that they're able to get, they oftentimes have to defend it. They have to be able to physically defend their land, their wealth, and their power, and then they also have to be able to defend it in the court of law. Right, And so I lift this up to say what it takes to get there is, yes, it's the relationships, it's the individual action, and then it's also all of us being politically engaged and not allowing ourselves to feel comfortable enough to say that um, the, the individual actions are enough, that we actually do need to have a systemic response that is equal and commiserate to the level of harm that's been created. Thank you. I actually have a question, and I'll include you in this, Deb. Um, you talked about time and things moving at the speed of trust. And I've been thinking about that for a while, too. Um, but I, I also think, I worry about we don't have enough time. So how do, you, how do we think about balancing the urgency of you know, 15 more years before things really fall apart and the, t the time it takes to build authentic relationship that, that will shift this? So I'm, just, I'm curious about. I think we can walk and chew gum at the same time, right? I think we get to... I can't. <laughs> Don't choke, please. I love you too much. Don't do that. Um, I think that, you know, as we're working through a project and trying to figure out, well, how this potential investor could resource this project, those convers when we take time to have those conversations, yes, we're working out the structuring of that particular investment and how to ensure that it's a non-extractive investment to make sure that we move the money as fast as possible, but it's through those connect those conversations that we're actually building the relationship, right? And so finding the ways and the opportunities to, to, to get out of our own ways and say, well, first I have to wholeheartedly understand you. I have to like really be on the ground in the weeds with this community before I can actually just do the thing that I have access to move right now. And so um, I guess I'm encouraging us to, to figure out how, how we hold both, how we both turn out to vote, how we be engaged in our communities, how we be good civic stewards while also you know, going to the block parties, getting to know our neighbors, being a part of the community building that needs to happen. Great, great response. And I would just ask those of you in the audience, how many of you are involved in moving financial capital? And how many of you are involved in moving social capital? How many of you are working on public policy and advocacy work? Okay, I could go on and on. So we need all of it, and I agree with your response. And it is part of what we discuss and work on through the Integrated Capital Institute, that everything happens at the speed of trust, really, whether it's political change or social change, environmental policies, changing our financial systems, but it all starts with relationships and trust. So there's social community and uh, active political activists. Uh, why do we use the term financial activist? Because the, you know, one percent, the whole one percent movement, if you do the math on that, that leaves a lot 
of people that have concentrated wealth, really large concentrated wealth. There is uh, estimated something like $50 trillion passing hands in North America alone in the next three decades through death, through generational transfer of wealth. That's just one big pot of money. With all due respect to the wealth management industry, I'm part of it in various ways. Um, what we are mostly doing is figuring out how to help people make more money <clears throat> to protect their base and expand it. There are all kinds of good reasons for that in certain circumstances, but it's gotten out of control. We don't have good, fair, we don't have fair taxation. We don't take care of the commons. We don't take care of the social safety net very well. We've abandoned a lot of that. So there are many reasons that we're creating a situation that might be untenable. When someone has the eureka moment and says, my capital needs to do better, and, we, and they come to us in the financial movement, we're not financial activists. We're maintainers and growers of wealth. So <clears throat> if we did that for everyone, that'd be good. So there need to be people who have a social change mindset and understand theories about how, we, what, some of what's been being said here, analysis of society <clears throat> and what's needed. Money is an incredibly creative tool and instrument. It can do phenomenal things, but it takes creativity, imagination, commitment, analysis to shift it from doing further damage and at least reducing damage and doing less harm and more good. So financial activist idea is that there are some people with the mindset to understand enough about financial systems, enough about political, economic, social systems, to use money the way some very notable players with intentions I don't like have figured out the ecosystem of how to control and dominate society. So we need people who understand enough about that that can start moving money to different people, different places, different outcomes. That's what a financial activist is. It's a mindset, and that's what this Integrated Capital Fellows Program is about. Please consider being part of it in the future and support it. Thank you. All right, I'm going to continue on this path of asking you simple, quick questions. I'm going to ask you each two questions. You can choose which question you want to answer, or you can do a combo. So, Joel, I'm going to start with you. How have you activated different kinds of capital to affect positive social change? And what's wrong with impact investing as we know it? In two minutes, please. Yep. <laughs> well, the how is, uh, I, I've kind of touched on it. The how is we have to have a different understanding of the world and what our purpose is, what the purpose of our life is, what's the purpose of humanity. Uh, and then it gets to be a really fun, creative job. There's plenty of creativity here. Unbelievable amounts of creativity possible with money. We are mostly constrained in a fairly tightly designed system that funnels it in the same ways. How do we... Uh, What's wrong with impact investing as we know it? Well, impact investing as we know it is ready to become social change investing. It's ready to become a part of a puzzle and a map of deploying capital in better ways. So impact is a wonderful step that has happened for the last couple of decades. A number of you have been involved in it for those years. And it's a step. It's like the training wheels. Now we've got to go deeper and we have to do our inner work to determine if multiplying our money at the highest rate possible makes sense with the amount of capital and privilege that we have or is it a tool for joy, better future, long-term future, and stable society going forward, stable ecology, stable society, and a functional world? Akaya, why is courageous leadership at the heart of a movement of financial activists? And what's the greatest lesson you've learned about money? Well, I'll start with a second. The greatest lesson I learned that money isn't very real. Like, it isn't. 
because, I mean, I don't carry around clamshells anymore. I barely have bills. And so it, money is one of those things that sits on my computer screen that has ones and zeros and zeros and ones and fives and all of that, but it isn't very real. So it took me a minute to get that because um, it's a set of agreements among, our, among us that some things are worth, other, worth more than other things. And so therefore we can give them a greater value. Like that makes no sense to me. And I know that it, that's part of the problem that runs this whole thing, that those of us with more resources are somehow better than those of us with fewer resources. And that's just a lie. So the premise of money, which began, I'm assuming, as a way of exchanging things, um, has become a very distorted way of um, separating us, isolating us, and killing the heart of us. Now, that said, it's also very useful because we're not post-money yet, although we're getting there. Um, you know, I'm, I'm learning about that. Kristen Hull is helping me learn about that, um, how to invest wisely and um, how to, for those of us who come from communities who have not been the investors, to actually step into that work and go, oh, I can use this resource that I have to bring about th good things in the, in the world, which is really different, I think, than some, a lot of us who come from social change who, who have been taught that anybody with money is automatically bad and wrong. So um, we got to shift that, that whole thing. What was my first question? Why is courageous leadership at the heart of a movement of financial activists? I think courageous leadership is the heart of any movement independent of financial activism, if we're going to change the world, change, I hate that, um, if we're going to transform what, uh, what our interrelationships are, then it takes courage. It means that I'm going to have to maybe get really uncomfortable with looking at what I think I know about certain folks and uh, think I know about myself and interrupt that. That takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of courage to tell the people that you come from that you actually disagree now and that you're going to do things differently. It takes a lot of courage to get in a boardroom and say, you know what, this is wrong. I can't say yes to this. It takes a lot of courage to step out of the way in which we have been imprisoned by our social identities and refuse to be bound by them any longer. Um, one last thing, we can't do this by ourselves. We actually need each other. And we are going to have to do that work of needing each other well in, a way that, that, in ways that are non-extractive, that are mutually enhancing, and that um, make a collective difference. And that goes against gravity in this in this culture so we're going to have to to make some that's takes a lot of courage thank you amaka if we're going to address climate change and economic injustice what do we need to start doing and what do we need to stop doing and what gives you hope I now know how the presidents feel on, up on the debate stage, or the, the candidates, right? They're like, how are you going to solve world poverty? Um, um, yeah, so I think this question of what are we going to, what we need to stop doing and start doing, I'll start off first by saying my work on restorative economics is intentionally rooted in the frameworks of re uh, reparations. Um, and the practices of restorative justice because I personally believe that in order to actually start to trans, not just change and reform, but truly transform society, we do need to close that gap. And we need to close that racial gender wealth gap um, in a way that helps to repeat, repair the harm that has been done to those communities that have been most extracted from, most exploited, most excluded from the benefits um, of our current economy because in, when we do that, 
then they have the skills, the capacities, the resources to meaningfully participate in the conversation about how we transform our economy, right? When we don't include their voices, when we continue to assume that those that have continued to lead and be in power are those that are gonna get us out of the problem, um, will unfortunately continue to do more of the same. And I think we already see our movement in our field replicating a lot um, of the same harmful habits and practices that are rooted in patriarchy, that are rooted in racism. Um, and we could go, unfortunately, through all the isms. Um, and I think that's really problematic and concerning. And so I think that's both a stop and a start. Um, I think the, the other piece to to what I think we need to start doing. It goes back again to this comment around grace. I think indigenous communities have extended a tremendous amount of grace to all of us. Um, I recently learned of the, the statistic that 80% of the world's biodiversity um, lives or sits within indigenous um, held land. Right? They have shown us so much grace um, and continue to offer wisdom um, to us and the ability for us to engage in a place of deep listening, um, to engage in a process of reparations, um, and to really um, do that in a way that we understand not only supporting those indigenous communities, um, but also continuing to acknowledge and, and support um, low-income communities, working poor communities, communities of color, um, undocumented immigrant communities, the trans communities as well. Being able to ensure that those communities have voice and vote um, in how we start to transform our economy is, um, is extremely important to me um, and the work that I do. I think this question of hope um, always kind of trip, it trips me up a little bit. Um, and sorry to be the cynical one um, um, in the room. Um, on one hand, I, I think hope is a very um, helpful posture to have. I think hope is a thing that keeps, keeps us motivated. It's kind of that light that we can look towards. And at the same time, what I've observed um, and what I know um, is that hope is also a privilege, right? It means that we still have a little bit of a buffer, a little bit of a landing pad that's just a bit softer than others that allows us to kind of still be hopeful for something to be better, right? Those people that we see living on the streets, those people that we see really struggling to make ends meet and living paycheck to paycheck in our country, um, I, don't, I wonder how much hope they have, right? Um, the other thing that I've seen, it's those people that have been in the harshest situations, um, those people that unfortunately have come to a moment of desperation because all they can rely on is themselves, their family, and their friends. Those are the ones that have also kind of come together to be able to kind of leapfrog over the incremental reforms into something that's truly transformative, right? So when we look at natural disasters like the hurricanes hitting the Caribbeans in Puerto Rico, the communities that were hit the hardest, the communities that were also then able to support one another were those that had the microgrid um, systems, right? They had the solar panels, right? We saw this also um, in New York when Hurricane Sandy came and those, the um, Red Hook, um, a community named Red Hook had a community-owned Wi-Fi system, right? That community-owned system was, that community-owned Wi-Fi system was a thing that allowed people from a seven-mile radius to come to that community um, and then access Wi-Fi. So I think, even though I'm saying like, I don't know if we have hope, there are ways in which, you know, I continue to see those projects, those initiatives that are community governed, that are community owned and steward as kind of the bright spots that are able to kind of weather the literal um, um, and figurative storms that are coming down. Um, and I would also say, you know, through our cohort with ICI, we've already seen people taking on amazing projects. You know, I. Um, Yes, maybe like myself. Um, I, oh. You can't see it, but I'm blushing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so, you know, we continue to see, hopefully people have heard from some of the speakers from Thousand Currents work with the Buen Vivir Fund. We have Guy Three sitting in the back. Hopefully some people have had a chance to talk to Aaron Tanaka and Nia Evans with Boston Ujima Project. Um, Kate Poole and Tiffany Brown from Cordata Capital will also be um, at SoCap later today. We have Bill um, in the room as well. So 
So yes, I, th I just think we need to be mindful when we ask people to have hope, right? Who gets to have hope, right? And we also need to continue to do the work. So, you know, we're gonna keep chewing the gum or sucking on a mint maybe and walking um, and walking at the same time. Thank you, Amaka. All right, we're gonna open it up to questions and we have Joanne's gonna help us with a roaming mic. So when you, before you ask your question, please share your name and your organization. Hello, uh, my name is Ron. Uh, I work for AV InBev, and I wanted to ask, kind of, I'm one of, I'm one of those disruptors from within the, the system. What advice do you have for like young financial activists that are looking at the best and most effective ways to disrupt the current system? Believe in yourself. Don't give up. Find your people. Don't try to do things by yourself. Gather around and keep working. This, is, this system isn't built for you. It really isn't. And yet, I'm looking to young people. I mean, I'm too, I'm, you see this, right? Uh, I've been in it for too long, and um, not too long, for as long as I've been in it. But I'm not gonna have to live then. It's the young folks, the disruptors, who are going to pave the way for the, our great-great-grandchildren who are actually calling to us, and we need to respond. So don't let my generation interrupt your work. You keep going. Beautiful. Thank you. Other questions? We've got one up front. Economic development organization that is doing innovative things, but there is such a large gap between where they are and current funding sources for them and the connection to impact. And, and I, I, I don't, like I've been participating in conversations, I, I haven't heard what is happening, what people are doing to close that specific gap. Um. It's a great question. Um, I would offer, there's a project um, I recently finished working on called Restore Oakland. It's based in the Fruitvale neighborhood um, of East Oakland. It was a joint initiative of two organizations, once again, the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights and Restaurant Opportunity Centers United. We did an equitable economic development project, 18,000 square feet, blah, 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 blah. I think one of the things that I learned in working on that project was that being able to kind of find those, um, those financial partners, right, that were able to kind of work with us in the early stages, those that were able to kind of provide us with both the grant dollars, but then also the long-term patient capital that allowed us to do the capacity building of our staff, that allowed us to do the business plan and feasibility, those were the things that then we could say we had de-risked our project when we would then go and talk to kind of traditional capital markets um, around how to then finance the acquisition and then the bridge loan um, for the project. Um, I think finding those partners that are willing to work with you that can also then help you leverage, right, the terms of the type of capital that you're trying to get um, is also extremely important. Um, on this project, I found that um, community development financial institutions were kind of the, our, our greatest allies um, in both the um, the early stage acquisition loan, the pre-development dollars, but also the new market tax credits. I'm not totally sure the scale of development project that you're doing, um, but the way the CDFIs are structured, their source of funds through um, the CRA, CRAs also made it possible for them to work with us in a way that, unfortunately, the um, the PRIs, the MRI of sides of foundations, and then even traditional community-based banks um, were not able to work with us. Um, so those early partners um, are really critical to, to getting to kind of closing that gap. And for funders that are in the room, please think about all of the ways that you are investing, lending, and giving. And please stop demanding market rate returns. Market rate returns are extractive if we demand it every time. We need to think about integrated returns because if we're only thinking about financial returns, we're gonna have concessionary environmental returns and we're gonna have a concessionary social returns. So provide the philanthropic capital. That's the most disruptive capital we can use. 
invest in PRIs. There's so many options, but, but please make sure that on the ground community organizations get funded and early stage so-called risky social enterprises get funding. I also want to ask us to start thinking long term. So it's not, oh, the deal's done and buy, but we're actually building relationships that will last for a long time. Um, and that's part of that speed of trust thing, because if somebody's going to come in and give me a bunch of cash, I'm going to get something done, and that's the last time I ever see them. Or I may come in, dump a bunch of cash on somebody, and then say bye. Um, what if we were to think about investing in this person and their dreams over time, um, so that it is about building partnerships that are beyond the deal? There, there's, there's a moment where things shift suddenly and quickly, but that moment usually had many, many acts, years, days, minutes that came before it in order to happen. We are nearing an inflection point where there's no option but to use money more wisely. If those of us that are working in these fields and have for some years have already seen dramatic expansion of the ideas, of the creativity, of the options and opportunities, but it's just starting. Work on, <clears throat> we have to work on our own inner self, our psychological, emotional, spiritual, that helps us know that we're doing what we must do, and to have some faith that there are more of us, find each other, keep at it. Each example and model will build a bigger base, and there's already a pretty good-sized base out there. So the idea of, if any of, hopefully not that many people here are worried about becoming a billionaire, but that's just a symbol. Become enoughness and use your billionaire energy for billionaire of good deeds and billionaire of things that matter and actions that matter. Don't worry about accumulating huge money. Influence huge money. And I think that that's how every change movement actually, there's a cycle and we're in it. Can I say something? That whole question of what's enough is something I think each of us needs to grapple with. Like how much do I really need? And then don't have any more than that. What if? What if we said, you know what, here's actually what I need and I'm not gonna be driven by the fears of lack and then whatever I, if I have extra, pass it along. Pass it along. Part of the problem is, is all, all, all of these resources are being sequestered based on greed and fear. I'm speaking to foundations right here, y'all. Um, and what if, what if instead of 5%, what if foundations started to give out 10% a year? There's no law that says you can't. Just says you can't give less than five, doesn't mean you can't give more than five. For real. What if we said, hell, okay, let's be done in 100 years, the spend down. What if? So that whole question of what is enough um, is an important one both individually and collectively. And you involved in foundations know that that 5% includes all your admin expenses also. Hi, um, Alex Fair from Impact Asia Pacific. Um, I'd like to go a little bit deeper, if we may, and talk about courage. And I'd love to know from each of you, when you've been faced with very big odds, big barriers, what has been your most courageous moment that you can identify to get to where you are now? Thank you. We've got eight minutes, so you'll need to be brief. Yeah, that, yeah, I feel like you want me to go into a therapy session. So if you want to do that, we, we, can, we can go there. I mean, I think, I think courage is waking up every day as a black, young black woman who has the audacity to engage in the finance field, right? I think I am very much used to people not kind of seeing me as a person um, that has any experience, knowledge, or expertise in this body of work. Um, and every day I still have to show up because I'm committed to the communities that I come from and the communities that I serve. Um, and so I think this is an opportunity for us to all look within ourselves and figure out what are we committed to? 
Where are we committed to living most in integrity with ourselves as human beings and showing up and doing that every day? Right, I think that is, um, I think that's the task at hand. Right, I think the other piece that we're, that we're also faced with is, can we also engage in a practice of vulnerability? Vulnerability where we are also able to recognize our faults, where we are not perfect, where we're messing up. I think for me, even this question of um, what is enough, I jumped a little bit, right? Like as someone who, you know, my parents grew up in the villages of Eastern Nigeria, I know what it's like to kind of go back home in the summers and, you know, not have running water, not have electricity, but I also know that I'm coming back to the United States and I'm gonna have those things. So the vulnerability to understand even the work that I'm doing and what I'm asking us to step into, all into, I am also deeply scared about what it means to have the radical redistribution of land, wealth, and power that I know we ultimately need. But you gotta show up and do it anyway. Well said, beautiful. You're here. Hi, my name's Patricia Hinnon. I'm with Capital Sisters International, and I'm sorry I was a little bit late, so you may have addressed this, but how can we get the donor advised funds to do more impact investing? It seems like money's just piling up and fees are being paid, and this is supposed to be for charitable, pur charitable purposes. Mm, great question. Joel, do you want to take this? Donna Daniels, do you want to take it? Joel, you want to start? I, 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 all of the above that we've been talking about, it's a wake-up call. It's getting people to be more aware, more conscious, and take responsibility and be courageous. Yeah. yeah. We, at RSF, we have donor-advised funds, and we're all about flowing money where it's needed most. So we don't get rewarded for that. In fact, our incentive system is for us to hang on to it, but we encourage people to flow that money because money is energy. It's like water, it's like blood. If it's not flowing, it's not healthy, it's not doing any good. So flow that money. And if you're looking to a DAF provider, a donor advice fund provider, make sure they're flowing it. Make sure they're not sitting on it. Could I add to that really quickly? I think the, the other piece is policy. Right? Like, I don't think that we can act as if our philanthropic policy just, you know, we're just doing 5% out of the goodness of our hearts. We're, only, we're doing that because it's a, a tax haven, right? So when we talk about the political action we need to take, we actually need to change the policy, the, the tax policy that allows DAFs to continue to hold those assets as well. Um, so we, yeah, we gotta do both the moving the money and also changing of policy. You know, you talked about, ask about courage whatever cousin you was talking about courage, um, move things, move things. Stop keeping things to ourselves, pass it along. Um, it's choking us and we're choking the planet. And so it's, it's really important to, and, and here's what I want to say, none of us can do this by ourselves. Policy, it ha we have to, gather, to get together and, and change policy. Um, systems are created by people. No one of us can do it, but if we don't change the systems around us and challenge the systems, then nothing will shift. And I think we often make the mistake of thinking, oh, one individual human, I love that little quote we use uh, by Margaret Mead or whomever it was, uh, but even then she talks about a collective group of people. Shift the policies. Use your privilege. Everybody has some. Use them. Use it. Use it wisely. And don't pretend like, oh, I don't have any power. There's phenomenal power in this room. And to be able to go, okay, yeah, let me move this, let me use my power in a way that creates wholeness and refuse to, to not do that when I, when I have the capacity and the, um, and the power to do it. And that quote from Margaret Mead is, never doubt that a small group of committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. We have time for a brief comment or a brief question. Well, I, I just want to say that uh, about held money. There's a big secret, which is that if you actually activate your money and you get involved with people and things that matter, you're going to probably feel better and be happier. 
and have a better time. And in some ways, we can use regulation, and we need to. We must have the proper policies, but we have to inspire people with stories and share the joy and the privilege that it is to have the opportunity to do good works by choice. That's, that still exists. Grab it while it's here. If you want to learn more, please come up and say hello. Give us your cards. Check us out online. Akaya Winwood, Joel Solomon, Amaka Agbo. I'm Deb Nelson. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure.